From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and your family are sheltering in place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to having you back in our Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. Our speaker today was born in Eritrea and educated through high school and bachelor's degree in Eritrea. Then he migrated to the United Kingdom and at the University of Reading was awarded his Master of Science and PhD in Animal Science. As a postdoc in the UK, he began studying the fascinating subject of, we'll call them cow burps, and the methane that comes out of cows, how to diminish it, and how we can influence and or diminish global warming by influencing the diet of these cows. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, Hermes Cabrab, to talk to us all about his favorite subject, cow burps, and the environment. Hermes, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. So Hermes, tell us all about how what we feed cows can influence our life on Earth. Thank you very much for having me today, and I'm uh, very much excited to talk about what we've been doing with uh, uh, cow burps and, and try to reduce or slow down climate change. So uh, before we delve into that, I, I like to give a, a, a context about um, uh, animal source foods and why we, we need to consume uh, animal source foods, um, because the, the, the main question would be then, well, if you don't have uh, a livestock, then you know, you, you, you will reduce those uh, methane emissions. But um, for livestock, you know, it's not just protein. We, we're not eating, uh, we're not using animal source food just for protein, but uh, a lot of it is to, because of micronutrients that are really important for, for health. And animal source foods are really the only source for a number of nutrients that we need, like vitamin B12, um, vitamin A, and um, heme, which is part of the, the uh, hemoglobin and vitamin D. Uh, and, and it's also a major source of uh, others like thiamine, ripoblavine, vitamin B6, and, and vitamin E as well. What, one of the advantages of animal source food is that um, a lot of those nutrients come in a bioavailable form, like with zinc or iron or, or others, they are much more bioavailable, which means that the body can absorb them quickly. Uh, as opposed to those nutrients that are, you can get from plants, but you need to eat a lot of a lot of that from plants to be able to get the, that absorption level high high enough to get enough for, for your body. And, and it, it is also quite hard to replace by fortification, mainly because of that uh, bioavailability issue. And lack of um, animal source foods uh, who, uh, who is, has been correlated with uh, the issues uh, such as stunting. In this graph, you'll see that on the x-axis is the different uh, countries, and then the bars show how much meat is being consumed in those uh, in those countries, and the dots show the, the, the level of stunting. So you can see the a very good correlation between countries where consumption of animal source food is low, you see high stunting levels, and countries with uh, high uh, intake of uh, animal source food, you see very low um, levels of uh, stunting. So the average American eats yeah. about 100 kilograms of meat per year. Yeah. That's like two pounds a, a week. Okay. Interesting. Fascinating. And so, um, and your point is, there's almost a direct correlation between stunted growth and lack of meat. And so the vegetarians in our audience, and I was twice a vegetarian, once for one year, then another time for four years. They always argue that it was more nutritious to be a vegetarian. What say you to that? No, it's not nutritious at all. I mean, uh, it's not more nutritious than the animal source food because animal source food uh, is a very dense nutrient. They have a dense nutrient in a small amount, like in a in few calories, but you have much more packed into that into that calorie. Um, yeah, the reason we eat livestock and the reason that people are stunted is because uh, a lot of places you, you get a lot of calorie, you get a lot of grains and starches and nuts and all that kind of stuff, but it's not enough. Um, you, know, you, you, you need to have a balanced diet and to make that uh, balanced diet. Yeah, I mean, if you have different vegetables and all that, you may be able to, to get those uh, nutrients that you need. But if you are a child, you know, un under five years old, it's very difficult to get everything you need 
from uh, only vegetables. And that's why you see a lot of issues with people who try to be uh, vegetarian at a young age, you do have uh, a lot of malnutrition uh, mm -hmm. issues. You do need dense nutrients to be able to grow as, as normal as possible. I noticed it on this chart, United States is listed, but uh, I, one assumes the reason you haven't listed the other developed um, Western democracies, you know, Great Britain, France, Italy, Germany, and so on, is because they're all close to the United States. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes, yes. They, they are, yeah. the OECD countries are kind of, the intake is um, similar. The micronutrient deficiency is not just a problem in low-income countries. Uh, you know, this is uh, the data from the, from the government. It shows that more than 30% of women in the U.S. have at least one micronutrient de de deficiency, with iron deficiency being the most common one. Um, so having nutrient-dense food is, is quite important. What does the bottom uh, greater than one mean down there? What does that mean? A blue section. What's the blue section represent? And I see B12 and folate only. Tell me what. what yeah, so it's, it's, it's basically the, um, the, the deficiency that, that the people are experiencing more than one type of nutrient is basically what it's saying. And so iron only, your point is that something like, <clears throat> it looks like, you know, 15, 14% of all non-pregnant women in the age category during 2003 to six were suffering from um, um, not enough iron. Exactly, yes, yes. Okay, gotcha, okay, great. All right, so uh, now moving on to the environmental impact. So when we raise, um, livestock, we do have an environmental impact. And that is uh, for, for, for agriculture, for example, here, as you, as you can see, um, it's 14% it's and then that 14%, we can break it down where it's, where it's coming from. Let's look at the left chart for just a second. Is this total greenhouse gas emissions? <laughs> yeah, so, 64%, is, so talk about that chart. Yeah, so, so on the left side here is the total greenhouse gas emissions um, globally. And you will see that 64% uh, of uh, the majority, the vast majority, it comes from um, energy. Uh, so that including industry, uh, buildings, and, and, and transportation, all of that will account for about 64% of all the emissions. And about 14% of all emissions come from agriculture. Um, and then when you say agriculture, I'm, I'm talking about all agriculture, plant and animal agriculture. And, and then about 10% is uh, through uh, land use, uh, change so um, deforestation in, in particular when you when you change uh, forest into a uh, different type of uh, production system you release carbon so that's uh, one of the ways we have uh, emissions and then a number of other things smaller things that also make up to 12 percent as well we're looking at the 14 percent then we can see that and the majority of that is from the ruminant enteric fermentation so this is basically the belching from cows and, and uh, other cattle. Uh, so a third of it is coming from that. When you say cows and cattle, you don't mean sheep, you don't mean chickens, you mean- Ruminants, so that is cattle, sheep, and goats. Um, yeah. Grazing animals, grazing animals? Grazing animals, yes. Grazing that's animals. That's ruminant? Yes, that's, that's right. So grazing animals is uh, mostly ruminants. And so we, we see uh, a third of it of all coming from that. And, and the rest, you know, we have rice, for example. Rice is a, a big uh, source of emission as well, because 16% uh, of, uh, of the emissions come from rice in the form of methane as well. How and does you, rice emit methane? Uh, paddy rice, it's, it's in uh, anaerobic conditions. You have, uh, it's covered in water, and that is a really good condition for the microbes to, to uh, convert the organic matter into methane. So methane is being released from uh, from uh, rice paddies. So rice fields, rice paddies yes. are just slowly emitting methane is what you're saying. Exactly. Part exactly. of the biological process yes. uh, of, of rice paddies. Okay. When you say energy agriculture, what do you mean by that? 20 this is basically uh, tractors and uh, you know okay. uh, a lot of the, the machinery that uh, you use to conduct your, your business in, in agriculture. So that's not transportation separate. That's all uh, industrial processes related to agriculture is 22% of the emissions. Okay. And then soil fertilization. How does that pollute? That's, that's mostly 
uh, we use fertilizers to, uh, uh, to to grow crops, and and so the that process uh, includes energy spent to form the uh, urea and, and other nitrogenous compounds. The Haber-Bosch process is an energy intensive process uh, to, to to make those mm. fertilizers. So that's that's why we have here. Okay, so now on your basic thesis, which is that you can reduce greenhouse gases by reducing the methane emitted from cows and other ruminant animals, that's 33% of those emissions come from that source. What about that 7% of ruminous waste of the pastures? What about the manure? Are those yeah. likewise favorably influenced? So these are basically the for manure. So the, the, the manure that is left on the, on the field or the manure that's stored and then uh, applied to the field have some some emissions as well. So if you if you feed the cows, um, you know different feed the kind you're going to propose, and you reduce the methane coming from let's call them cow burps, thirty three percent. Will you also favorably influence the methane which comes from the seven percent of and the nine percent categories in the bottom of the chart there? Not really. I mean this this, this is the, the the waste product. So this is from the. Uh, from their feces and urine, so the, this is not affected by. That doesn't. Mean, we, we don't fix that. We don't fix up their waste. We just fix up the burp part of their waste. Yeah. So the, yeah, there is a different way to fix the others, but uh, um, uh, my work is is related to the, uh, the the burps. So in other words, it's a third or thirty three percent of the fourteen percent, which yeah. comes from egg. so that's our target in this discussion. That's fine. That's right. how, do you, how do we reduce a third of 14 percent? So yeah. in other words, about five percent. If we can reduce, yes. we'll be reducing global emissions by potentially as much as five percent. OK, yes, I'm all, we're all ears. Uh, so the main way that uh, the livestock contributes to climate change is methane emissions. And if you look at where the methane is coming from in the in the U.S., you will see that uh, so the biggest slice is the uh, natural gas and petroleum systems, about uh, again, close to a third. And then enteric fermentation, which is the, the burps, is about uh, 27%. And then we have landfills and manure and, uh, and others as well. So again, it's quite a big proportion of, uh, of the, the burps, uh, of the methane through the burps. So that's what we're trying to reduce. Got it. And we have a legislation um, in California, the Senate Bill 1383, um, that's basically uh, um, trying to reduce what's called the short-lived climate pollutants, particularly methane from dairy and, and uh, livestock and from organic waste and, and landfills as well. And so this basically will is trying to limit the amount of methane in the state to be reduced by 40% by 2030. So we have nine years to come up with solutions so that we can reduce our methane by 40%. So just to, to give you a, um, a background of uh, why uh, ruminants belch out methane, uh, basically, they, they do have a very unique uh, way of uh, digesting food. The, the reason that they can uh, take grass and, and uh, uh, straw and other things is because they, they have a specialized stomach and it, it's broken down in the stomach. And the way it's broken down is that they work with uh, microbes, a lot of microbes in their, in their gut that help them break down the, the, the high fiber. And so when it's broken down, they, it produces hydrogen and that, and then there are other microbes called methanogens that will take that hydrogen and use it as a source of energy. And, but the, 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 there is a byproduct and that product, byproduct is methane. So that methane in the, in the stomach, instead of being kept there, the animal then gets, re, gets rid of it by belching it out mostly. About 95, over 95% 95 of, the, of the methane that's performed in the animal is coming out through the mouth or, 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 or the nostrils. So, really, 90% is coming out the. Over, yeah, well over 90% is coming from, uh, through belching. Okay, so it comes out of their mouth. Wow. Yeah. So I was saying burps to be polite, but in reality, you're telling me that's pretty accurate. It is more. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, but we actually don't even measure what comes out, uh, that comes to the other end of the cow because it's, it's so small. Okay, so essentially you're saying these five types of microbes, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, et cetera, those uh, create the bio process inside the gut of the cow, which produces all this methane. I guess. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
And if you look at sort of the, the methane uh, carbon cycle, you can see that um, uh, the, 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 the carbon is, is being um, taken up by the, by the animals. So the, the, when they eat grass, uh, then they, that's basically carbon. And then, they, and then it, it goes into the animal's body and some of it is, comes out as a manure, uh, but some of it is being converted into methane because of those microbes we just talked about. And that goes into the atmosphere. And in the atmosphere, it stays for about 12 years. And then it is uh, broken down and becomes, uh, again, carbon dioxide and, and water and goes back into, into the fields. And that carbon dioxide is then taken up by the, by the animals. So there's a cycle going on here where the, that carbon is only in the atmosphere for a short period of time, relatively short period of time, but there is a, that there's a, a, a carbon. The difference with, with the carbon from fossil fuels is that we are actually bringing carbon in from uh, deep, that was locked in for a long time and adding into the atmosphere. So there's a net uh, adding of, uh, of carbon when we're using fossil fuels, so when you're burning for fossil fuels or you know, the, that carbon is additional to what it is on in the environment. While with the cows, it's actually a cycle. It takes a long time, but it's a cycle. If you don't change the number of animals they, they have over, over a 12 year period, there's actually no net increase in, in, uh, uh, in emissions and in and, and, and global warming, because basically it gets destroyed every 12 years. So as long as you keep that level of methane constant, then you don't have the, the effect on, on global warming. While, while carbon from fossil fuels and, and others, it keeps adding to it. So we have a, a really exponential type of uh, increase in, uh, in global warming. So the methane that comes out of the cows, is, and it, we're calling it methane, is it all the same methane? Or are there worse kinds of methane? Or is methane? Yeah, so the, 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 comes, the, the one that comes from, uh, from the animals, we call it the biogenic methane. So it's, it's, you know, it's part of the biogenic cycle while the one that comes from fossil fuels is just adds methane to the atmosphere. And so there are different ways to reduce this uh, methane from, uh, for, for, from animals. Um, so this is just a, a kind of a summary. You can have a direct uh, effect on the animal themselves, or you can do it indirectly by changing their diet and uh, sort of the conditions in, the, in their stomach, or you can do it uh, changing the microbes in, in, in them as well, or you could also have, uh, you can breed uh, animals that have lower methane uh, uh, as well. So there are different ways of doing it, but we're gonna be uh, looking at some of the, only a few of those because uh, we, we don't have time to get into all of that. So just looking at, you know, for the longest time, what we've been doing is working on this, uh, changing the chemical composition of the fiber and, and basically um, changing the diet. And what has gotten us is that, this is a, a work that we've done comparing the emissions um, in 1964 compared to 2014. So over the last 50 years, what changes have we accomplished? And so on the x-axis is different um, sources of methane. So methane from feed production, methane from farm management or enteric, which is the burping, manure management, and, and the total. And the, and the y-axis is the greenhouse gas emissions per unit of milk. So we are basically, we are standardizing it for, for milk. So to produce one kilogram of milk, how much emission are we having uh, in, in 1964, which is the red bar, and in 2014, the, the blue bar. So over the last 50 years, we have really, really reduced our, our emissions per unit of, of, of milk. So to, when, you, when you produce one kilogram of milk in 1964, you are emitting over two kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent, while now we are emitting close to one kilogram of uh, 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 equivalent. So, which means that we have reduced it, uh, forty-five percent reduction in enteric methane emissions. Why is it going down? Because they, we increased the milk production. Each cow is now producing a lot more milk than it used to be, and in, 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 because of, we, we changed the nutrition, we changed the genetics, we changed the management. So, all of these things have changed so that now we are making a lot more milk from one cow than we used to uh, 50 years ago. And then we reduced um, water in, uh, used by 88%. Uh, and this is because uh, mo mostly uh, improved crop genetics and management, 
uh, better uh, irrigation and all that. So we uh, really helped us to, to, to get it down to, to this level. And land footprint also, you know, the land requirements for crop production were reduced by 89% in 2014 compared to 1964. This was mainly due to dramatic increases in crop yields in the last 50 years, the greater utilization of byproducts in diets and reduced inputs such as fertilizer and, and pesticide use as well. So the land savings are roughly the same size as the state of uh, Connecticut and, and, and California. So that's quite a substantial reduction there. So uh, basically, we, uh, we, we, we are we've been producing more milk with less land, fertilizer, water, and, and so on and so forth. So this is you know, mostly for, for California. And the, so why did we see lower greenhouse gas emissions from California compared to other regions? Mainly because California farms typically use greater amount of byproducts compared to other regions. You know, we have a lot of almond holes. If you've ever been to, to a dairy, you will see that mountains of almond holes there. And, and then we will see that in, a, in its lifetime, about 49% of its feed is actually byproduct that we cannot use. Um, uh, and so, you know, uh, the, the only thing is the, the transportation from one place to another. Otherwise, uh, we, we, don't, we, we use a lot more byproducts now. 50 years ago, maybe about 3% of the feed was byproducts, but now it's almost 50%. Okay, so let's look at the, the main, so the, 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 the directly uh, affecting the, the, the emissions. And, and so um, talking about the seaweed, so how does this, this came about and uh, why, why is, is it reducing? Uh, it, it was actually first noticed by a farmer in uh, Prince Edward Island in Canada um, he looked at the, the, the cattle seem to do well while they are sort of grazing uh, seaweed. Uh, and, and he contacted some scientists there and they, they tried to look at uh, what's, why, why is it happening. And the, one of the scientists actually re relocated to Australia and started to uh, basically assess different type of seaweed. And, and, and then they, they found that uh, the red seaweed called Asparagopsis taxiformis to have reduced methane production quite, quite a bit in vitro. Uh, so this is kind of the, the start of my interest in this as well. When I saw this paper, I was like, wow, this, this sounds quite interesting and, and maybe there is there's something that we can do. Um, so they, they, they continue to screen the different type of algae um, they looked at asparagopsis and uh, oedigenium, and, and uh, so the, the top panel is the total gas production and the lower panel is methane production. And as you can see that for asparagopsis, when you get to 1% or 2% of, uh, of those, you start to see no methane uh, any longer. While for the green algae, unfortunately, you, know, you have to go like 75% to get any kind of reduction, which is not possible because you're not, you're not gonna feed cows 75% of, uh, of, of the green uh, seaweed because it doesn't have the nutrients that, you, that needs to support the, the animal. Yeah. So you have the same product on the left-hand column. It says CH4 production. Talk about that. So let's talk about the lower left quadrant. Yeah, so, so basically this is the, the methane production. So okay. CH4 is methane production. And when you add, when you, when, you, when you don't add anything, you know, this is the first bar. It basically shows you uh, that's, how, that's how much methane you expect. And then as you increase the amount of those, so this is uh, when, you, when you put in 0.067%, and then when you, as you increase it, then you, when you reach to 1%, when you eat, when, when you, maybe this is uh, uh, about, let's say, 50 grams or so of, the, of, uh, of seaweed when you, add, when you add to it, uh, this is in, in a lab. And it reduces okay. so much, you know, um, and then by the time you get 2%, maybe 100 grams or so, uh, then there is no, no, there's no more methane coming out. So it completely reduces the methane. And what's up above TGP? TGP is total gas production. So that's, that's just the amount of gas that's been produced when you, when you, put, uh, uh, when you put feed into uh, uh, in, a, in a glass jar. Because of the fermentation, you are, you're always going to get some gas. A lot of it is carbon dioxide and, and others. So we want to reduce methane, and that's, that's what we see. So I think the, the most important part is here, where you see a, a huge reduction in methane for asparagopsis, but not for uh, another species of seaweed. 
Uh, so this is basically how we we kind of do the uh, the in vitro screening. Basically, you know, we we put in and these are six six uh, cylinders up here, and then it's just gonna uh, we we simulate. This is basically we're trying to simulate the same as as a, a real cow. So this is the stomach of a cow, and because it always co contracts, so we 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 have a pistons here that push this, and then we put in the the diets and we put the seaweed here and then we measure how much gas is coming out. So all these tubes basically they were collected down here where we uh, collect the gas and analyze how much gas is being produced. So this is how we do it in the, in the lab to screen uh, if there is any potential. But you know, working in the lab is one thing and working with real animals is a different thing. So we have to take it to the animal. So this is this is where we were involved in and then we we were the first to to do this in uh, in, in dairy cattle. Um, so this is the seaweed. Um, basically, once we once it's collected, it's uh, uh, it was uh, uh, freeze dried, uh, freeze dried, and then crushed, and then it becomes like a powder like this, uh, like this powder here. And then we then add it to the normal feed of the animals, the cows. So this is like uh, alfalfa hay, for example, and then you just add into alfalfa hay and mix it all up, and then we give it to the animals. And, and, and when we did that, you see that there was huge reduction in, in emissions. So, the, um, so this is the control, no, no seaweed. And this one is uh, with uh, about uh, half a percent of seaweed. So these are dairy cattle, they're eating like 25 kilogram a day. Um, so half a percent would be about 100, 120 grams. Uh, of, of, of the seaweed, and then 1% is about 250 grams of the seaweed. And you can see that uh, by this level, they were, uh, the, the emissions were like 67% lower. So it's really, really a huge, huge impact. When you say by this level, what do you, show me what you mean by this level, you mean? At 1%, when you are giving them 250 grams, uh, the methane emission will drop by 67%. Got you. So methane is measured on the left in grams slash D. Yeah. So, so the first panel A is in grams per day. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and then the, 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 the second panel is basically trying to uh, standardize it by how much they are eating. So per, per so DMI is dramatic intake. So how much intake they are eating, that's, that's how we do it. But, you know, there, there has been uh, questions raised um, like, is it, is it going to be effective in the long term? Uh, would the animals be able to adapt to it? So, okay. so after that first experiment, we, we conducted another experiment. Uh, what we did here was in, in beef cattle is to have three treatments. The one is the control. So, so the, on the x-axis, we have um, weeks, right? from week zero to week 21, so about almost five months. And then on the y-axis, we have um, the, the methane production in grams per day. And we saw uh, this is the this is the amount of methane that's produced with no sea, with no seaweed with no additive. This is what this is what we see, and you see that after twelve weeks it drops uh, without any seaweed, and the drop oh. is because we change in the diet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so when we add to it, so this time we actually went even lower. When we added, uh, these are beef cattle eating ten kilograms a day. So when we uh, added, um, like. A quarter of a of a percent, um, so you know, that's that's like tw to twenty five grams or something like that. When you when when you, when you are at that level, you can see that a huge reduction there. And then when we increase the seaweed to half a percent, so we are now going to 50, 50 grams, uh, fifty to eighty grams a day. Then you can see that there's even a even more reductions that. that we Why see. is the bump initial in all cases? What's that? What's happening then? The first one is because they are eating grass. Um, so high forage is uh, less effective, and then at the at the end they are eating more concentrates. So it's it's effective. Whatever they are eating is effective. It's basically reducing the emissions by sixty to eighty percent of the uh, of the emissions. And the good thing is, uh, in Australia, uh, they, they 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 did the same work, and what they've seen is actually uh, there was an improvement in in uh, uh, bulking, bulking up of, this, of, of the uh, beef cattle. So they, they gain more weight. Uh, so this is, they have four different levels. They have the control here, 
they have low levels of the, uh, of the uh, asparagopsis, and then it goes up to high level. So in the mid and high level, they're actually better. The, the, the animals were gaining more weight uh, compared to the ones that, did, that, that were not fed anything, any seaweed. So control low, mid, high means when you gave the, the cattle a low amount of feed, not feed, no amount of uh, seaweed. Of seaweed, okay. Yeah. The, more, the more seaweed you gave them, the less methane came out of them. Is that what? The less, the less methane came out, and they 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 gain more weight as well. Uh, so this this actually has really um, uh, picked people's interest, and it's been reported in all kind of things. This is just the, the last couple of weeks. Uh, we have had a lot of uh, uh, over the last year or so. There's been a lot of uh, interest in this. And I'll show you a, a, a clip um, that was reported in, in NBC Bay Area. Climate and crisis coverage and a possible game changer in the fight against climate change. Greenhouse gas methane is a real troublemaker when it comes to the climate. Most of it comes from cows and other grazing animals as they break down plants. But as NBC Bay Area's Marion Faber reports, UC Davis researchers have just discovered that a simple ingredient found in sushi, of all things, could be the trick for drastically cutting down on methane. Cows are constantly chewing. Problem is, as they break down what they eat, they also belch out a lot of methane. Methane is uh, what's called a, a greenhouse gas. And what greenhouse gas do is they trap heat from the environment, which then eventually becomes the warming of the of the climate. But at UC Davis, researchers found feeding dairy cows small portions of seaweed drastically reduced how much methane they produced. So in our dairy study, we found up to a 67% reduction in methane. And that's not all. These cattle are bred for beef. And when researchers fed them the seaweed diet, the results were even more impressive. They saw an 82% reduction in methane. The UC Davis scientists use this special machine several times a day to measure the methane in the cow's breath. The theory is that the seaweed inhibits an enzyme in the cow's digestive system, so it produces less methane. But will the seaweed diet impact the taste of milk, cheese, and beef? While researchers did not test the flavor of milk and cheese from the dairy cows, they did conduct a taste test comparing steak from seaweed-fed steers to traditional steak. We had 112 people uh, testing the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, beef and they could not see any, they, they could not detect any difference in taste. UC Davis animal science professor, Dr. Hermes Cabrab, who conducted the seaweed study, says the cows received just three ounces a day, and it appears to be a low cost solution to get up to an 82% reduction in methane. This has a huge implication for the dairy industry because uh, the state has a mandate to reduce methane emissions by 40% in the next nine years. While more research needs to be done, the seaweed diet may be the first step in reducing greenhouse gases in agriculture and creating a more sustainable burger. So there's two parts there. First of all, when she says a more sustainable burger, she means not the dairy production, but the beef production. Is there any difference in uh, how, what happens with dairy producing cows and cattle? It's the same thing. I mean, the the uh, yeah. So, so, so the cows would would eventually you know, go go into the, um, the the meat market. Got it. Okay. Okay. So um, the, the the question now is that you know. So, so now now we know that uh, seaweed works. Uh, but the, the uh, cultivation of this uh, specific seaweed has been a barrier. It's not so easy to farm Asparagus taxiformis. It's, um, but there are a number of efforts going on at the moment to scale up production. Blue Ocean barns are growing seaweed in, in Hawaii already, and they estimate that there will be enough production to feed all cattle in the U.S. by 2030. Uh, so this is a picture of where sort of the, the, the stock of uh, seaweed they're collecting in, uh, in Hawaii. And then it moves into the laboratory looking at um, uh, to, 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 to try to understand how well these, uh, these are working and how, uh, how they can um, in, make it sort of growing quicker and in, in, in a sustainable way. 
so that we can have you know a dense amount of uh, of the seaweed. You can harvest on a, in, in a regular basis. Uh, once you harvest them, then you, know, you you dry them and then you, you turn them into a powder. It can be used um, to mix with feed and and be able to reduce methane emissions. So this is this, is this hydroponic seaweed or is this purely synthetic seaweed? Uh, so this is basically seaweed grown in in tanks. Okay, tanks, hydroponic yeah. seaweed. I, I guess you, I, I guess you could call that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Okay. In an aquaculture system, yes. The name Blue Ocean Barns is that a play on the idea that the ocean can be the source of the seaweed for the cattle, the feed for the I, cattle. I think so. Yes. Yes. Okay. I know you're the scientist. I'm the marketing guy, but I got it. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is definitely not my my idea. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, basically, just just to give you uh, an idea, you know, there are a number of other additives as well that reduce methane burps. But if you're gonna rank them, if you see uh, which one uh, reduces the best, you can see that seaweed is on, on top and by by far. And there are others as well. I, I'll, I'll, I'll go through a couple of them. We don't have time to go through all of them, but just, just a couple of them so that you can see, uh, you can compare them with, uh, with, with seaweed. Apples understand minus 103.6 and down minus three. What does that mean? So the, on, on the uh, x-axis here is the, the amount of methane they're gonna be reducing it by, this is in, in grams per day. How much, how much methane is being, is being reduced in grams per day? Right, so that's 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 what it is. CL, what is CL up at the upper right hand corner? What's this is this is uh, this is actually um, the uh, confidence interval. Oh, okay. So plus or minus five percent is what that means. Up yes, there. yes, exactly. So if you in fact give them a seaweed additive, you can reduce the methane production. Is that minus one hundred three point six? What is that? What units of what? Grams per day grams per day. So you can reduce the methane from cows by 103 grams per day. That's right. Okay. And if in fact, the bottom one, if you feed them garlic, you can reduce three grams per day. So yes. Yes. And in each case, is this pure seaweed or is this a seaweed additive or a garlic additive? So the, yeah, the, so the seaweed is the, basically the one I, that I showed you. And, and the, seaweed, the one- the Purely one. seaweed, they don't eat anything else besides seaweed? No, 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 no. They, they can't eat pure of any of this. This is just a feed additive. This is very, yeah, very small comparing, amount. This is comparing the multiple types of feed yeah. additives or feed additives you can put in the cattle's food. Do they notice it? Do they dislike it? Do they have any effect? Does it affect them? If it is too much, they notice it, but otherwise they, they don't notice it. It just depends. If you, if you give them too much, then they do notice it, yes. Okay, got it. Okay. All right. So the the other inhibitor, uh, the, the other feed additive is called free NLP or bovire, and, and it has been shown to reduce by about forty uh, percent. And this is this is really uh, so uh, uh, an experiment that was conducted. You can see that you know on the red the red bar here uh, up here is the control, no additive, and then the low the lower one here is when you different levels of the additive you can see a, a, a reduction in, 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 uh, in emissions. So this is a synthetic compound that inhibits methane formation in the gut. 3-N-O-P. Oh. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, an abbreviation for 3-nitroxypropanol. Uh, uh, That's the scientific name of the compound. Okay, so I don't understand this chart yet. So the control is, what's happening with the control animals? You, you don't give them anything. Uh, you just give them the, the diet with no additive. Okay. And it goes up in, at, on the ninth week, but you don't know what caused that. It, and it's no, I mean, this is not really a, a goes on. I think this is, this is just, just a, 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 a variability, a, a normal animal variability. So okay. um, this is going to be, you, you can look at this chart and say it's just a straight line. Got you. And so then you have the green line, which is those that have been feed, fed. Yeah, the other three lines, they are basically the same. So they start out at the same. So that's the important thing is they all start out at the same level here yeah. at zero time. And then when you, when you add seaweed, uh, sorry, when you add this uh, additive here, you can see that the control with no additive, they are 
producing over 400 grams per day of methane. But when you, when you add those uh, low, uh, medium, and high, you're reducing it like, by almost 100 grams per day. Does yeah. it go to zero? According to it, doesn't, it doesn't go to zero, no. It doesn't go to zero. It goes like third, down 33% or so. Yeah, yeah. It, it's reducing by you know, 25 to 30%. This chart shows the, what happens when you have a, a sustained emissions versus a declining emissions. And because methane does not stay in the atmosphere for a long time, it only stays for about a decade or so, there, there is a better way of, of, of measuring this. So uh, when we talk about GWP 100, this means that it's a global warming potential over 100 years. This is the traditional way of measuring, uh, estimating methane and its impact while GWP star is the global warming potential star, is an adjusted measure, which, is, which reflects more accurately because methane does not live in the atmosphere for 100 years. So this, the, the first one, the red one, is assuming met methane lives in the atmosphere for 100 years, which it right. doesn't. Um, so when you have a sustained emission, so there's no reduction in emissions, uh, this, is, this is methane emissions here, and then we have carbon dioxide emissions here, uh, will have will have the same uh, effect here as well, and then the warming. This is this shows what happens to the to the globe, right? So is it uh, is it warming by and how fast is it warming? Okay. If you use the global warming potential 100, then you're you seeing a much a faster rate of of warming. But as I said earlier, it doesn't live for 100, so we need to use a different metrics, which is this GWP 100, and it says that it will get warmer, but at, but at a much lower rate than, than we, it would be given this uh, Got it. Uh, the red line. The red line assumes that the methane lasts for 100 years, but yes. you know it lasts for 12, so yes. it's not compounding at the same rate. Got exactly. It. So if you decline emissions, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to reduce methane emissions. Uh, sustained, sustained methane emissions is what we're trying to achieve with seaweed and, uh, and other uh, innovations. So what is its impact to the, to the, to the world? Uh, climate change is really our, our ultimate target. And so if you look at the traditional way of doing it, it shows a slight reduction in, 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 uh, in this carbon dioxide emissions. Right. And uh, with the WP star, uh, it's, it's much different. But then the, the main thing really is how does it affect the world? How does it affect the warming of the world? So this is, this is why we, I'm, I'm looking at now at the bottom right um, graph here, the effect of the warming, if you then don't consider the methane lives in the atmosphere only for a short period of time, you would think that the, that warming will still continue to happen, um, even with the declining emissions, because there is still some em emissions coming in, um, then it will still go up. But in reality, because methane is being taken out of the atmosphere every 12 years, and, and then compounding with the reductions that we, are, we, we want to achieve, you can actually see a, a, a global cooling uh, effect. So we are getting to the negative. So zero basically means there is no warming. A, a positive number, obviously, increase in warming. A negative number, decrease in warming, so cooling. So uh, by, by reducing methane emissions, we could actually, in the short term at least, get a reduction in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the global, warm, uh, global warming. So we okay. have the situation in global cooling. So um, what I hope that then I can convince you is that we can get rid of this part of the ruminant enteric fermentation part uh, so that you know, the 33% th the th will, be, uh, will be taken out. My conclusion is that you know, there are several solutions that, uh, to mitigate enteric and manure emission at the moment. Feed additives like seaweed and uh, uh, 3NOP and, and others that I, sh I showed you earlier, they have been developed, but not, not yet on the market. Now, none of them are yet uh, on the market. In the, at least in the US, you can't go out and buy seaweed to reduce methane or, or other of the feed additive solutions that I, that I, show, that I have shown you. They're still in development. And seaweed, compared to all the other feed additives, seaweed has shown the biggest potential in reducing emissions. And we've seen that 80% you know, uh, reduction that, uh, in our, in our uh, uh, experiments here in Davis. And in Australia, even bigger uh, uh, reductions have been shown and elsewhere as well. So it's not just Davis, but this work has been done now in other places and they basically corroborate what we've saw or what we've seen uh, in Penn State, that's about 80% in Australia up to 98%. So this has a huge promise. And there are a couple of 
companies right now, one in uh, actually two based in uh, Hawaii and one in Australia that are really working on this to, to uh, uh, scale up the production. We need to have a protocol to, to be able to uh, uh, account for, the, for this methane and then we can actually incentivize farmers to use this and then they can get carbon credit from it. That is just an uh, acknowledgement of uh, a lot of this work has been supported by different companies and the, the state of California. Um, so just uh, giving acknowledgement that we received funding to, to do this work. Hermia, it's a very fun uh, cartoon at the end of a very poignant presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your scientific research with us. Those of us who are hunting for ways to save the planet, welcome the cow's help and specifically your good science to uh, help us with this amazingly perplexing problem. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this. And with that, we adjourn the Wednesday Yachting Lunch. This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.